Hello you multi misbehaving malt managements. And thank you to Poiter or Piotr, Piotr Ledachowski or Peter Ledachowski for that malt mention. Ralphie Review 937 Extras. Now in an Extras review I'm not specifically reviewing a whisky or any other quality liquor. I'm giving a more generalised view to help enhance your overall knowledge, awareness and perception malt mates so as that you can understand what's actually going on in the whisky world the bourbon world, the rum world and the cognac world, the liquor world. So I've just reviewed some Johnny Walker Black Label and it was a pretty low score. It's the lowest uh, blended Scotch whisky mark I've ever given because frankly the flavour is rough. You can barely notice the involvement of the single malts in this blend because such is the acrid, coarse, rough grain whisky um, which is the way it is frankly because of the quality of casks being used for maturation and the way these casks are being prepared and I mean prepared in the fullest sense of the word before they're actually filled with green mixed mash bill whiskey, which is a major component of most um, Scotch whiskies, blended Scotch whiskies. Uh, a blended Scotch whiskey can, in fact, be a m blended malt. So you might not have a mixed mash bill column still whiskey in it. It could be 100% single malts from different distilleries. And in fact, that is probably one of the most exciting value for money areas of Scotch whisky at this moment in time. Uh, whether it be Compass Box or Douglas Lang's bottlings or the various other um, offerings, particularly from independent bottlers. Because single malt distilleries very rarely produce blended malt versions of their own whisky although there's absolutely no reason why they, they, they cannot do it. None at all. And in fact, if they were intelligent about it, it would be very much accepted. But it doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen yet. So I did the best thing that uh, I could under the circumstances with this Johnny Walker um, brand. Uh, I put it into a tumbler with loads of ice and a slice of lemon and if you go into a bar and you order a scotch in the rocks, this is what you're probably going to get. And that slice of lemon will probably be an optional extra. Um, and uh, this is one with these little bit of fancy, you know, little bit of fancy trimming, you see. They can up the price in the bar. And that is why a successful bar is an absolute money printer. Because people, particularly after they've had a little bit of alcohol and they're socialising and they're showing out with friends and foes and all the rest of it in public bars, stop thinking objectively about the value of what they're buying and start to pay over the odds for fancy presentation and packaging. And this takes us right into cocktail culture. And this is a really good place to start when exploring the concept of product and brand. Right. Because the reason cocktails during Prohibition were rediscovered, because they've always existed um, since distillation ever happened. The first cocktail makers were in fact the herbalists who knew that um, alcohol preserved the medicinal pro properties of herbs and spices very, very successfully. And thus they would create their infusions. And it's also noted that the Greek philosophers would put some of these infusions of herbs and spices in concentrated liquor into their cheaper wines uh, to make them a little bit more medicinal and to cover the inferior flavor of the poor quality wines. And um, 
This is where it all starts. The Prohibition era was where the modern cocktail was really established. And particularly during the Roaring Twenties um, and the Shabin culture, and you had this is where all the glassware came in, different shaped glasses, uh, different uh, coloured liquors, whether they just be artificially dyed or not. You'd have all the colours of the rainbow. It was theatre. That's simply what it was to help people deal with the prices and to make more of the inferior liquor that was available it was all dressed up it was put into a theatrical presentation it was pantomimed and in a sense you have something like that happening now where large companies start to move away from their products being what they should be, in this case a whisky, and they invest in their product being a brand. And we're in the age where brand consciousness has never been more prominent than it is now. So for example, if you go out and buy sporting equipment, particularly sport clothes, um, you people will go into shops and they will see the brands whether it be Nike shoes, Adidas shorts, or Puma vests, and they will buy not based on the quality of the material, or the fit of the garment, or the value at the cost. People will make their purchasing decisions purely on the brand, the recognisability of the brand. And there's a very simple reason for that, because the consumer has got a short attention span, they get plenty of money to spend, and they want to stand out by fitting in. Right? They want to stand out by looking anonymous. They want to conform, but not really appear to conform. It's the human psychology, and therefore they're brand-led. They will buy the brand. And this is exactly what you get with modern Johnny Walkers. Back in the 1980s and the 1990s, I remember Johnny Walker being a really good quality brand of Scotch whisky. You could actually, when you bought it, you could taste the quality because the owners had sufficient volume of quality stocks that, that they, they had it to bottle and they bottled it. Whether it be the excellent and underrated Johnny Walker green label, whether it be the competent red label or whether it be the distinctly superior um, black label which often could go toe to toe with a number of single malts at that moment in time particularly on the palate of less experienced people and that included myself then but times have changed and we're now in the age of two customers two customers to the whisky industry one customer is high spending they're well informed know what they're looking for and tend to watch Ralphie videos. In other words, they are informed customers and informed customers are brand aware but product led. Right, so, so I'll give you very good illustrative comparison to a product led brand. Springbank 10 year old. Springbank's a brand but it doesn't put itself out there and spend a fortune on presenting the brand because the currency of this brand is the actual quality of the single malt whiskey or blends or whatever that the brand happens to bottle. Generally there's age statements, not always, but generally there's age statements. It's 46% volume, so it's bottled to enhance flavour real flavour and also it's unchill filtered and natural colour. What you see there is a colour that's come only from the casks. No burnt scorched sugar has been added, added to make it look darker. So what you have is a brand which is a product whereas the Johnny Walker happens to be a product which is a brand and therefore the quality no longer matters. 
Here the quality matters because that's primarily what's being sold. Whereas with the Johnny Walker Black Label, um, the, the content doesn't need to be particularly good because what's really being sold here is the walking man and the branding. Uh, and this is basically alco the alco alcohol equivalent of Adidas, Puma or Nike. What they are to sportswear, Johnny Walker is a perfectly illustrated, illustrative example to Scotch whisky. Same would be for Chivas Regal, but Johnny Walker is the most widely known, it is the most prominent, it is the most globally available, most easily and instantly recognised and you don't even need a translator because you've got the power of the image. So when you see advertising hoardings, particularly in India, you'll always see the image of the label and it's all very kind of subtly tone lit with a little bit of backlighting and the whiskey always looks dark and amber like because it's theatre, it's pure theatre to persuade the, the masses who are consumers and who are easily brand led to buy this and when you're a massive corporate na multinational who needs the volume of sales on a global market because a, a small regional market simply will not sustain you then you have got no choice but to do this so I totally get it I totally get it and that's why I don't criticize it although I have said that that's a horrible version of Johnny Walker but hey I've drunk Johnny Walker on and off for 40 years I know what I'm looking at I know what I'm tasting and I'm confident in my own opinion because your memory cells the little grey matter up in your brain it's an extremely good archivist for smell and taste over the years because it's part and parcel of human survival. Another good illustrative brand-led product or product-led brand, sorry, product-led is an independent bottler. Classic example, old particular from Douglas Lang. This happens to be a cask strength, unchill filtered, naturally coloured 12 year old Talisker and what a beauty it is. It's one of the best Taliskers that I've tasted in over five years and I'll be reviewing it shortly. So these are, they're all whiskey, but for serious whiskey drinkers, people who are paying the premium for the quality of smell and the quality of taste because they are patient, persevering and appreciative of the complexities of very good quality spirits. This is what they're going to go for. These bottlings. Generally you won't find these so much in the bar. General bars. Mainstream brands, you'll find them in mainstream bars. But mainstream bars are shutting down now. Globally, all around the world, they're closing down. Because people can buy these brands cheaper at your Costco's and your Target's and in Britain it would be Tesco, your big supermarkets and of course online from Amazon or perhaps going through travel retail pick up a bottle for a summer barbecue somewhere sharing it with friends why go out to bars when you've got all the hassle of people around you who are drunk um, and filming you when you're drunk using their phones and then posting in social media it's a changed world now. So you will find these, these products, um, br brand, product led brands. Um, you will find these in specialist whiskey bars, well informed whiskey bars where they charge you a bit more, but there's a better environment. It's a more calmer environment. There's fewer distracting, unpleasant odors from other people around you. Whereas this is the complete opposite. It's a brand-led product, not a product-led brand. And um, I want to kind of conclude now by showing you how innocuous and powerful branding is, because it's part and parcel of the dark arts of marketing. So I'll take these wonderful, high-quality product 
lead brands off the off the barrel and I will bring another brand over right just bring it over just hold the can of ha my hands around the can already from the color of the can you can tell what this is as soon as I even show part of the name of the product I could only need to show one single letter and so indoctrinated through marketing and advertising is this brand in the global human consciousness that you know it's a can of coca-cola this is probably along with mcdonald's the absolute benchmark epitome of brand led product where the product is no longer important it no longer matters to such an extent that when you read the ingredient list in a can of coke it doesn't even mention the word cola nut in it it's a carbonated soft drink which is very high in sugar it's an absolute um, too much of this will contribute to diabetes and ill health um, but you probably know that it's dark coloured because it's got the same thing in it that the whiskey has it's got burnt scorched sugar caramel colourant and the thing is that when you come to the flavour this is the absolute crunch the flavour is very short-lived it's just generally sweet it's got a slight Turkish delight note a slight floral note and a slight spice note to it very generalized I suspect there's cassis in this poor man's cinnamon um, and the flavour itself is very light it isn't intense in any way it's almost suggested and this is the importance of this brand because you're not buying a drink so much as you're buying an experience you're buying an entertainment you're buying a brand and the brand is as little flavour as possible to distract you from it so whatever your palate anywhere in the world you'll get exactly the same experience and you'll enjoy it for what is not there it's not what's in the glass it's what's in the front of the can that's what's really this product is all about it's about the the heavyweight of the of the brand of the branding and this is the way whiskey is going it doesn't matter the quality of the, the, the whiskey anymore with the big brands because they find it hard to sustain and they need to trim costs at every opportunity to have more money to spend on messaging, marketing and advertising because that is their bread and butter now. So you have this sanitization of what should be in the brand what the flavor should be and it's left up to our own imaginations being guided by the the labels to to fill in the gaps and here's another classic example and it's a, a confectionery bar it is arguably the most recognizable confectionery bar in the world and what is a huge massive international industry and highly highly profitable this is made, made by the Mars Corporations, one of the largest privately owned companies in the world now. It's called a Snickers bar. And basically, it's some reasonable quality milk chocolate round uh, a nougat, a soft nougat, made with malted barley. And there is a mixture of peanuts and toffee on the top of it. And it's all wrapped in the chocolate. It is a brand and absolutely a brand the actual quality of the experience isn't particularly important it's a sweet confectionery and therefore people are going to rip off the label they know it'll be chocolate a bit of nugget and nuts and so long as they get the vaguest of flavors they will be happy as a 
passive consumer. The problem for these brands is when you have self-educated consumers morphing into customers, they start to question the actual quality of what is being packaged and presented with these brands and very quickly realise it is in fact inferior. It's vague, it's innocuous, it's utterly generalised to appeal to as many palettes as possible and therefore to offend none. And whereas as whisky drinkers, a sign of our growing whisky connectivity and knowledge through awareness of what quality is and the challenges quality brings to our palate and the far more, the deeper, more explorative, more satisfying, more intense, more amazing journey that we have when we go for quality products in, in comparison to just the passivity and the lazy, almost automaton consumption of branding, um, it, it makes a huge difference in life. I mean, people who are just knocking back Coca-Cola, munching candy bars, or just slugging back gin and tonics or whiskey and lemonade or Coke in a bar, they're, they're missing out on a lot of a lot in life, really. But an awful lot of people just they're happy to just chug along. And they've now and again in the sober moments they'll feel there's something missing from their life. They'll feel that emptiness, but they can't quite explain it. Well, I can explain it. It's what's called existing rather than living. And living is accepting challenges, doing an apprenticeship learning, growing and developing, discovering, achieving. And you don't do that with these brands. With these, not, it's, not, it's not their purpose. Their purpose is just to scratch the itch of consumption. And that is what the three of these things do very, very well. Whew. Hope you've enjoyed this, Mock Mates. I've explained a lot. You now know the difference between products which are brands and the difference between that and brands, which are products. There is a difference. Initially, it doesn't seem to be much of a difference, but latterly, it's a huge difference. And it's growing even more of a difference, the way, the way things are going these days. But we'll see you soon for my next Ralphie review of Talisker 12-year-old. Very juicy. See you then.